And uh, thank you for joining the Healthy Hectares um, project webinar on shade and shelter. Um, I'd just like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the various lands that where we're meeting on tonight and I pay my respects to the elders past, present and future. Um, so my name is Jubay Scorch. I'm with the Healthy Hectares project and, um, and I work for the uh, Wodonga Urban Land Care Network. And the Healthy Hectares project is um, funded by the national federal government and the land care, national land care project. So one of the outcomes of the Healthy Hectares project is to increase the knowledge and the skills of the smaller lifestyle property owners by offering workshops and webinars and covering farm planning, biodiversity, pest plants and animals, pastures, livestock, soil and water, and also specific management practice, such as the provision of shade and shelter for livestock and biodiversity. Hence this um, webinar. So, um, so the presentation will go for about 45 minutes and Kylie will ask um, answer questions at the end, but you're welcome to use the chat to put questions in and we'll go back to, uh, and we'll address the questions at the end as well as any other questions that you also have. So I'd like to hand it over to Kylie McCready. Kylie is a team leader of the land management with Agriculture Victoria, and she's got extensive knowledge and skills in shade and shelter and management for your property. So I'll hand it over to you, Kylie. Thank Thanks, you. Gervais. I will try and uh, hopefully share my screen with you. Oh, try again. Oh, sorry, I will just take a second. I guess some, some of you I've met over the course um, of the last couple of months and I have, um, I guess, been able to share with you some of the different experience that I've had in, um, in fire recovery um, and also generally farm planning. But when it um, really comes down to a lot of what I focus on and something that I'm quite passionate about is actually working in um, a space around shade and shelter. And that has quite a bit to do with the fact that over the time that I've been working with um, Agriculture Victoria and the various names that we've had over time, uh, I've been lucky enough to work with landholders in a range of different revegetation projects. So, um, everything from uh, plantings for high density management of um, dryland salinity through to um, fire links and corridors to firewood plantations and those type of things. So um, it's something that I have um, had quite an interest in for, for a long time and like to be able to share lots of the, the different ways in which we can look at vegetation on properties and how we can make that work um, for you and for your property as well. Um, and also as we address more seasonal variation, um, there's a increasing place for us to have a focus on, on shade and shelter, um, as well as all the other reasons that we put vegetation into our landscape. And we also might have existing vegetation in our landscape, which is not quite doing the things that we want it to do now. So. Um, how, how might we make that work for us? So tonight what I'm going to do is run through a little bit um, of a, a whole farm planning perspective and how you can look at um, how you would make shade and shelter and generally uh, vegetation work in your landscape and your property and get the best out of it for you. Um, so I guess one of the drivers of, of this for me too is if we actually look at what we have in our landscape at the moment, there's actually some interesting research that was done in about 2001. And it looked at what uh, decline was occurring in one particular catchment in Northeast Victoria. And it actually found that over a 29 year period, we'd actually lost 47% of those isolated paddock trees. <laughs> And those paddock trees are what we're often quite dependent on for, for shade and shelter. So if we consider um, those drought years in the millennium years through to, you know, uh, just decline that we might experience, 
what is left in our landscape and what we need to be doing to actually uh, be, be putting into our landscape for the future. So I will, um, just to give a, a quick perspective, because I could actually talk for 45 minutes on the, the whole farm benefits of shade and shelter. I will just put these into a very quick context because there's a really great resource that I will um, get Gervais to share with you later. And that was put together by the Basalt to Bay Landcare group. Um, and they brought together lots of great research. But when we look at the benefits to shade and shelter, there's the uh, increased property values. So th that research indicates around 15% increased property values where there's um, vegetation on the property. Up, uh, around 20 to 30% reduction in evaporation of dams where dams are buffered by vegetation, not placed on the dams, but in those surrounding areas. And that's also really important um, when we have those really hot years and low rainfall to be retaining all the water that we have. Other things like biosecurity buffers where you've got uh, different farming systems to your neighbours. And also as we have increased concerns around shed uh, animal health and biosecurity risks is having a vegetation buffer between you and, and your neighbour's livestock. It's a, it's a great benefit. Uh, other things like land remediation, so salinity, erosion and those type of things um, are all just some of the benefits. There's a significant amount of benefit to um, production. So uh, both hot and cold situations can impact livestock production in terms of uh, fertility rates, mortality rates, uh, and even things like live weight gain and um, uh, wool production or even um, pasture production. So all of those types of things are actually um, captured in that document, which I'll share with you. Um, just expanding a little bit further on animal health, it's often easy to think about the extremes of the hot and cold. And it also is important to note that it doesn't actually take quite high temperatures for livestock to actually become quite stressed. So in looking, for example, in a milk production situation, where temperatures reach 27 degrees, and with a humidity of 80% or where it might be 31 degrees and a 40% relative humidity, which is probably your average summer day in, uh, in Northeast Victoria, stock, livestock, especially cattle, are already being impacted and are showing a decline in milk production. So it's not necessarily the extremes in that context. But what we do see is where the extremes jump from really high temperatures to changes in low temperatures. Um, some of the greatest losses of sheep in Victoria have actually occurred in December when we've had cold fronts move through and, and there's been um, large amounts of, of death after shearing of those stocks. So it's not necessarily July, August, it might be December and it, and it can be that actual um, change from one temperature to another. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break down what is shade and what is shelter, just to really um, pull apart what it is that you might be looking at needing on your property and how you establish that. So shade's really about stopping that um, direct uh, sunlight and it can actually be natural or it can be man-made. So your man-made options are actually um, quite it can be quite expensive and they need to be well um, designed because you need to maintain that flow of air um, if that doesn't happen then you can actually um, have some negative um, consequence the advantage of of a, of a natural shade is it's a little bit more cost effective um, it might take a little bit longer to establish but the long-term benefits and the wider benefits are, um, are greater. But how much shade is enough? So there's actually some um, research that's been done that shows that around four square metres of shade for each head of cattle at noon is an ideal amount. And there's some really great maths that you can do to look at um, where we are on the planet and look at how much um, shade is created. So. If we were looking at a 10 metre high tree, we'd be getting um, 
actually under five metres of shade of that tree at noon. Um, and if you are interested in those numbers and, and how to calculate that out, then um, certainly get in touch and I can share some of that um, science and, and information around that. So some of the principles for shade is really um, looking at your um, orientation and look at where that large area of shade is in the late afternoon. And are, there, are your neighbours getting your shade? Is there that um, boundary shade um, going somewhere else? So um, think about that when, if you're planting areas of, of new um, clumps and isolated trees can provide uh, great options for shade. Fence beyond the root zone to protect the trees from compa compaction and manure. And that's probably one of the greatest threats to the long-term viability of plantings, especially native trees that just don't cope well with the compaction and the high level of nutrients. And equally, that's why feed and drinking water should be placed away from those areas of trees. And airflow is actually really important for part of that cooling um, as, as part of the shade. So um, also um, keep that in mind. So I guess then we sort of look to the other side of things and what is shelter and, and shelter really is that slowing of winds in, in our landscape. And if you really think about um, some of those drawings, which like I've got here in, in the middle, it's about getting those winds to go over the top and, and having those areas of trees and shrubs. Um, and what I'll, one of the other points um, just to raise is that a lot of the information I'll share is from various bits and pieces of, of research and, and often um, large areas of, of shelter has been established. Um, and so a, a lot of these principles uh, uh, can apply to small properties as well. And we just have to look at things a little bit differently and I'll, I'll try and touch on that. But principally that um, providing shelter is about getting those winds to divert and dropping that, um, that wind chill and exposure that stock are getting. So if you um, look at some of the research that has occurred, they have found that wind speed drops for up to 50% of the wind speed, five times the height of your shelter belt. So if you have a shelter belt that's 20 metres high of trees for 100 metres out from that area, you will see a decrease in the wind speed by 50%. Equally, if you have a one metre high shelter belt, you will achieve a 50% reduction in wind speed for five metres away from that. So we often think of, of shelter as being long corridors when in fact uh, areas of shrubs or areas of combinations of shrubs and trees can also be um, a great benefit. Um, some of the principles when we start to look at really long corridors is that uh, some turbidity can be created at the end of those um, long corridors of trees. So some of the researchers suggested that the length should be a minimum of 10 times its height um, to be um, taking into consideration that um, a potential negative effect. Uh, even density from the ground level to the top so um, that we are creating that density and, and that diversion of winds over the area. It needs to be multiple rows, so multiple rows two to four metres apart and consider a repetitive pattern. So if you can't have um, a, sh a shelter belt that's long, um, consider how you might have smaller areas. Uh, consider the need to have other uh, areas where you might have gates or, or um, gaps in, in your shelter belt. So having patterns of, of sh shelter can help any of that diversion of winds. Have a mix of trees, um, shrubs or, or small grasses if you're looking for that really wide traditional type structure and be practical and used by stock. So have a look at your landscape and where your stock like to camp. And if it's on the tops of the hills or it's in particular corners of paddocks, how their behaviour might alter if you are establishing areas or equally how they might still like to go back to the, their favourite spots. <laughs> 
So some of the um, key points around um, design. So I guess what I was trying to do there was just break down, is it shade or is it shelter or is it both? Um, so be clear about what you're trying to establish. Um, what shelter do you currently have and can it be enhanced? What are the multiple benefits that can be achieved? So do you have areas of um, eroded gullies that need to be fenced out and how uh, fencing those out might be a benefit to any land degradation, might create a, a, um, a biodiversity corridor, but it also might be able to break up your property in a way that can um, provide multiple benefits for shade and shelter. And also how will shelter be managed? It's important to consider any shade and shelter as being just as any paddock, um, as a paddock might need management, then these areas need management as well. So um, this is uh, some really good principles around where to start. Um, it's also, I guess, a key message around protection for biodiversity values. And it's also, I guess, key when you start to look at the economics, because one of the the biggest things when you're doing any of this um, work around vegetation is the cost and especially the cost of fencing. So some a, a principle to follow is to protect what you have first, protect those high value areas um, and if necessary, use those at times of high um, need or, or times of um, climate or um, conditions that you need to use that shade and shelter, then um, that would be any of those um, areas of remnant vegetation that you have. So protect them by fencing them out. The next step would be to consider enhancing areas. So if you have areas where you might have um, some large paddock trees or some patches of trees that you might fence those out, you might need to consider some understory plantings or you might need to fill in some, some gaps with some extra trees. So that would be the next step. And then last of all, consider restoring that vegetation. So that might be those areas where there's absolutely nothing um, at this point in time. And, I, and I'll just touch on those biodiversity benefits that ANU's actually got some really good research that breaks down where they're seeing some of the um, increased bird um, numbers at areas that are sort of some of these junctions that you um, create when you're joining um, corridors together. So there's some really good research out there. If you're interested in that, I can point you in the direction of that as well. Okay. So just some important design considerations. So insufficient shade and shelter can force animals together, which can be an, an issue for animal health. Um, so it can um, share illnesses and diseases, but it can also create quite a, a hot environment um, for them to be in. So um, that's um, something to consider. Turbulence is one that I've, I've touched on a little bit before and is it's also important to, um, when I show you some examples later on, think about any um, wind direction that you, or tunnelling, as well as turbulence, um, some tunnelling. So I'll show you some examples where you might want to watch out. Um, frost zones. So there has been some research show that um, if you plant along contours, you can create frost zones. So if you've ever been driving through a paddock um, and feel that change in, in temperature, if you've experienced it, you'll know exactly what I mean. Um, so sometimes um, creating long corridors along contours can uh, emphasize that. Um, think about weeds and pests. If they're there now, um, best to manage them early on and um, incorporate that in your long-term management and integrating um, into your farming system. So what are the animals that you have? Uh, what are their behaviours in um, different cold and, and hot um, temperatures? What pastures and fodder do you have? Which paddocks can you lock up to have stock in at times of extreme um, weather conditions? Do you um, sow 
certain pastures or crops and then you have to exclude stock at, at different periods of time and how that might um, influence where you are planting areas of shade and shelter. Our land class is important. So is there areas of um, hills and things which are low production value that might be better planted out that could be providing areas of shade and shelter and, and especially um, areas of um, biodiversity benefit uh, in the landscape. Also, as I, I mentioned earlier, uh, things like planting out along uh, waterways, which might currently have nothing planted along them and be uh, enhancing those and layout. So what works for your farm? Do you have laneways um, or yards and how you might incorporate vegetation into those landscapes as, as well? layout into those features in your farm. So the design considerations really come down to a couple of things. So the orientation we mentioned before, um, orientation is also important to consider where your extreme weather comes from. So I talked about um, north south orientation for shade, but also think about those really bad days, um, do they come from, do the winds come from the same direction that your average day-to-day um, -day sort of winds come from? Uh, height, so height, you can, um, you know, look at how you might as establish those trees over time. So don't just think about what that's gonna look like for the next two years, but think about the next five to 10 or 20 years and, and the life of a, a a tree planting area. The length of it, so we talked before about that influencing um, the turbidity, or turbidity, turbulence, sorry. Um, and so what we can do is we can achieve some really great things by long corridors through landscapes and biolinks, but if you've got a smaller property, how you might be able to um, consider some of these other things um, like continuity and, and repetitiveness that's further down your density of your species. So they suggest that shelter should have 40 to 60% um, density when you're looking at your, your shrubs. So, and what that really means for landholders in the Northeast of Victoria is that we start to look around at our, our natural environment and we do have a really great combination of, of shrubs and understory and trees. If you're out on sort of more of the flat um, cropping country, it might be that you need to be looking at a slightly different um, density to what you might see in the environment to, to create that um, shelter. But your number of rows, your spacings between your plants uh, also give you that um, density and the overall look. Your establishment methods. So if you are looking at your um, processes on your property of um, protect enhance, restore, you might already have some large trees. You might be able to take advantage of some natural seeding. You might be able to undertake some direct seeding or you might be able to um, do tube stock planting. So you can have these different methods that can allow you to build on, on your designs and, and what you might be doing. And your continuity and repetitiveness, that's really important where you might have a smaller property and you might want some smaller areas and they'll have an overall benefit rather than one sort of large um, planting that you um, start with. So species composition, um, I've especially put down here because that, I guess most people first think about what they want to be planting um, not necessarily how it might look. And so there's lots to consider about um, species. So in terms of um, biodiversity, uh, sticking with the ecological vegetation class or those species that are known to grow um, in your area is really the best. Um, they're the species that um, will have many more of these uh, benefits. You can also look at native species, species that might be growing over the hill or in other similar um, landscapes. And that's probably a, a really important one as we start to look at how um, climate might affect our plantings long-term. And some people will say, well, how will climate change look, you know, 
influence what we plant. And really what I say is have a look at where you're planting and if it's a creek line or a hill, um, really look to what is growing in those drier or wetter areas. Look to neighbouring catchments or neighbouring areas. Don't necessarily look at what might be growing 300 kilometres away, um, but look to, to that different environments that things might be growing in in our, in our local landscape. Um, and that will also help if you're looking at more shrubs and things that you might not have a great choice in your area, but you want to have a bit more options for mold, multiple benefits, then have a look at those neighbouring catchments and, and see what you can get. There is some um, research that's been done about um, fodder um, species of trees, especially through droughts um, and how they can be used and introduced and deciduous species. Um, there are options, certainly not ones that I have a great deal of experience with, but I certainly would suggest that when you're looking at planting um, along laneways that might be wet or around yards, then those would be, tend to be preferred options for um, shade in summer, but a good bit of sunlight in winter. And there is also some um, good research into alternative industries in um, especially firewood and those type of things. So lots of our local species in the Northeast can be very easily um, identified for some of those options. The things to watch out for, especially um, on small properties, especially for horse owners, um, and more so for anything that has wool, uh, alpacas, sheep, those type of things, just to be really conscious of um, toxic species, um, prickles and spikes. Um, great for um, little birds, M might not be so great um, in small areas. So if you are doing that sort of planting, look at planting those species closer to the inside of any shelter belts and, and, um, and stick to some of the other ones on the outer edge. Uh, be conscious about what's, what are weed species too, um, especially if you're looking at things that are introduced or fodder um, species and things like that. Just be aware of what you can grow in your area. Um, so planting by ecological vegetation class, there's some really great um, fact sheets on this to, that make it really, really simple. And you can go through and um, look at what is in your area. For Northeast, I can share with you a link um, of where to find those and you can print off the, the sheet. Um, if you're not in the Northeast, um, there is a, a website that you can look up and, and gain um, that information not quite as pretty um, in, in the fact sheets, but it's certainly possible. So happy to guide anyone in the use of that if they would like it. Um, I guess the other thing is in planting in, in local species, um, you, it's hard to go wrong. Um, if you overplant or you underplant or, um, you know, things are, uh, a little bit more flexible than if you tend to be planting um, species from outside the area. Um, conditions can change and you can see um, losses of, of trees um, quickly um, that aren't suitable for the environment. Um, equally, I haven't really touched on sort of saying uh, single species are often really great for, for landscape and aesthetic purposes, but by planting by ecological vegetation class, where you're really looking at a diversity of trees and shrubs, you also um, shift away from that risk of, of having everything um, lost in, in one sort of change of a season or um, an illness or a, a issue with the, the tube stock and things like that. So what can be shade and shelter? So I guess, we traditionally think as shade and shelter as long corridors that you know are 20 to 40 meters wide and run across a whole farm and that's not necessarily practical for a lot of properties and so um, what I wanted to do is break it down and show you some examples of what can be shade and shelter and how you can make it fit on your farm so Shade and shelter can be blocks, clumps, corridors, 
corners, individual trees, hilltops, laneways and maternity paddocks. And it can be trees, shrubs, grasses or even artificial. And as I sort of have showed with the value in a, a 10 metre high tree versus a grass, you can still or shrub, you can still be reducing that wind speed. So what combinations provide the best opportunities for your property? So I'm just going to um, quickly go through some pictures um, and then they might prompt some ideas and, and questions and I can try and give you some of the positives and, and negatives about some of this sort of stuff. So um, this is some pictures of some firewood plantations that were put in. So um, this is early photos and in dry years as well. So these are great in, in that you've got some other long-term um, production values from the firewood, but also um, wide spacings allow some grazing or sheltering of stock within those areas. Um, these often will have um, rows of um, trees for firewood and then they'll have uh, a few rows of understory um, species as well that'll be, be, be left in those areas longer term. Uh, clumps and corners. So when we're talking about um, prevailing winds uh, coming from the different directions, uh, these corners and clumps allow that um, stock to, to shelter as well as um, find a, um, a spot that they prefer on days when the wind's coming from different directions. And it uh, might work uh, in small properties where you want to be able to um, put vegetation into to small corners and get the greatest benefit. Corridors, so lots of these across the landscape on bigger farms and have a really great value for biodiversity and linking up large remnants and waterways. Um, one of the, the picture uh, down the bottom, it actually has an example where landholders put in about three or four rows of trees and then decided that the um, corridor wasn't wide enough. And so I think it was often perceived for a long time that if you'd put in a corridor, you couldn't really go back and put more trees in that they might not grow. Um, these landholders have, have successfully increased the size of their corridor quite um, significantly. So that's an example of just having a look at what you've got now. And if it's not quite working for what you want, then look at how you can make it um, have the outcomes that you want it to have. Individual trees, uh, these are a really valuable asset in our landscape and we can take advantage of these by actually fencing out some of them and encouraging regeneration where possible. So. Um, you might not have to go and plant. Um, and sometimes we see this happen in, in different years where there might be low stock levels or really good seasonal conditions and the trees will come up um, and you might even be able to put a fence around them and protect them so that when you put the stock into those areas, they won't um, impact them. Um, other times you can look at where uh, the seeds will drop from um, the wind and, and be able to um, create some areas of, of natural growth and encourage. Um, you might look at planting some understories, species and shrubs to really give though that greater biodiversity a benefit to those trees as well. Um, individual paddock trees, they're all um, of great value. And if, if you can't do anything else except for plant uh, individual paddock trees, then there is a great benefit in doing that. Don't feel that everyone has to plant 20 or 40 metres wide on their property. And there's lots of different ways um, to protect them. Uh, you might not have noticed at the very start, but when I share my presentation with you, you can see that actually one of my photos is the rhinoceros enclosure at the Canberra Zoo. And I figure if they can work out how to protect trees from rhinos, then farmers can have lots of options for protecting paddock trees from their um, livestock as well. So um, lots of value in isolated paddock trees. Uh, hilltops. Hilltops are often an area of lower um, productivity and can provide lots of multiple benefits. Um, 
can take a fair bit of work to get established on some of those areas, but definitely worthwhile and have yeah, huge benefits. Um, so this is some examples of where paddocks have been um, created. So not just corridors, but paddocks. And this is one I just wanted to touch on um, in highlighting uh, tunneling or of winds. So you can create some really great wind breaks, but make sure that they're orientated the right way. And I wanted to touch on this too, because I've seen um, where smaller property owners might just create um, five to 10 trees in a row and then space that out 20 or so metres and then put in another row of five to 10 trees and actually have that um, gap in the middle that they can use for horses and other livestock when conditions are bad. So they might fence it all out as a bit of a square, but open it up when it needs to be. But just be really careful about the orientation of those trees um, that you're not creating um, any, any tunnelling. But this also highlights um, being able to plant and get good pasture growth between those tree belts. And in the bottom photo is also capturing a trial that occurred where they used um, some grasses with phalaris type growth pattern to grow um, to, for lambing and using a repetitive pattern, uh, take advantage of that concept where if something grows even only to a metre high, then they're still getting that five metres of um, lower wind uh, impact after it. So um, good examples there. Um, some more just um, wider shots of paddocks, paddock scale plantings. And then this one's just to highlight that sometimes you have to think outside the square. Um, a trial looking at um, grass based phalaris for lambing, which was similar to the one before, they did that during the millennium drought and the stock literally ate the entire trial site. So the researchers turned around and decided that they'd try some hessian. It was expensive, it was time consuming, but they were trying to um, get some results from their research, which they did, um, but it's just not quite the same as you would get from a natural planting. But sometimes um, you have to think outside the square, which is why the round bales are there too, is that sometimes you have resources on your farm and if after shearing conditions turn bad, it's where are those placed and how are they also um, providing buffering on your property? So just a couple of tips about implementation of any shade and shelter. Um, always include a gate. Fencing is really the expensive part, um, and the most labour, well, labour intensive. Um, when you do it, you want to get it right. Um, don't dismiss using um, electric fencing if it's possible. Uh, it comes down to your stock and, and how you know them, um, but always include a gate because even if your stock don't get in, the neighbours will usually a week after you've planted your trees. So um, also consider spacings and access for any um, fire management. Soil preparation is really important um, as is weed control. And so I wanted to touch on those that in the whole scheme of looking at what um, shade and shelter you're establishing, if you were to do look at your sites now of what you might want to be doing in the next year or two, if you're looking at that soil preparation and your weed control now, then that's really great um, progress. And then you can get out there with some uh, uh, posts and some paint or some uh, tape and get some ideas about what you might um, want to put in your landscape, but start looking at those um, preparation um, type things. Pest control, um, things will eat your trees. Uh, they will eat them in remnant areas and they will eat them when you plant them. So um, looking at how pest control can happen in your landscape, especially if you're surrounded by lots of small properties, then you need to work together and do that in that year or so before um, planting as well. Um, look at ordering your plants or seeds early to get what you would like. And, um, and that gives that um, certainty around what that structure is that you're 
trying to um, create and plant and to guard or not to guard. So I've worked on really big projects where there's been no guards and they've been successful and I've worked with small projects and had the whole lot destroyed that hasn't been guarded. So it's really about um, getting a sense of what happens in your area and, and what works um, for you. There's no um, exact recommendation I can, I can give you there. So some of the stuff about management, uh, be prepared for replacement planting. So I'd say the last 12 months, two years have been great years for planting. Um, we've probably seen some really high success rates even late in the season, but be prepared to go back. Um, and whether that's planting different um, species in into a site or whether it's just accounting for, for losses. So um, you, if you really wanna create that density and structure, then you have to just be a little bit persistent exclude stock until it's well established um, and never leave the gate open. But the reality is we're dealing with a landscape that has been grazed. We're dealing with pastures or weeds and we need to be able to control those and you want a, a balance. So um, you would need to look at your own site um, and make decisions, but often you can be crash grazing with a small number of stock, but never leave, leave the gate open. The other way to look at these areas is to identify when there's times of extreme need. When are those really cold times or really hot times or, or when they're dropping from one to the other and use those areas at the, that particular time. So, um, and as I sort of said earlier, Things like um, grazing, weed control, pest control, thinning, fallen timber on fence lines, that's all part of managing a paddock. A paddock of shade and shelter um, versus a, a pasture paddock, it still needs to be managed. So um, just a couple of key points, and then I've got a couple of resources that I'll go through and then I can take some questions. So shade and shelter is essential for animal health and it has many other benefits. So when you're looking at designing your areas of shade and shelter, if you really want to be um, getting some biodiversity benefits or if you want to be uh, selecting some firewood, think about those other benefits when you're planning Understand and identify times of critical need for shade and shelter on your property. Identify your outcomes. Is it shade, is it shelter or is it shade and shelter? Take a whole farm approach and look at all those protect, enhance, restore type principles. Design with management in mind. And shelter is a long-term investment, so manage it as an asset. And I'm, some of you may have heard me talk before um, that Putting trees into the landscape is hugely uh, uh, motivational and uh, rewarding um, to see. And I think I used to do um, projects that would see 120,000 plants put in, a, in the ground in, in a year. And it wasn't until we stopped having that funding to give to landholders to do that. And people would ring and say, hey, you know, do you just have a tray of trees? that I really started to see the value and importance that those trees and shrubs are in the landscape to people and the difference that you can make. So, so think about that long-term value of what you're putting in the landscape. And I put down the bottom here, do something now. Um, there's so much to digest and there's so much to think about, but get out there and get some paint and, and draw out some lines and, and, and throw around some ideas and, and peg things out and, and start to, to do something. And, um, you know, you can always add to it, start small and, and add to it. So um, don't, be, don't be afraid, um, just, yeah, do something and make a difference. So I've got some resources. And Carly, can... we've just got about um, 10 minutes to go total. Just... Yep, no worries. I'll just be really quick because these are going to be shared with everyone. So um, so in saying get out there and do something now, um, Gervais will have some resources such as this. This is a bit of a, 
stand in the paddock and, and have a look around at all the types of things that I've talked about, whether it's landscape, land class, different shapes, different methods of planting. So print this off, go out in the paddock and, and start thinking about what you might do and take an aerial photo with you, get the textures out. So we'll share that. And when I talk about extreme um, weather and, and knowing things too, there's some good resources. So the Bureau of Meteorology has some ag type resources. So um, dig around and, and have a look in there. Cool cows, they have some really great um, information on shade and shelter and case studies about dairy farmers and it might be different to what you do but it's really great um, to see the principles that they apply. Um, Agvic has some newsletters, the break, the fast break, the very fast break newsletters and if you want to have an understanding of what the next three months might look like in um, the next six months and whether it's a good year for planting trees or not or whether it's going to rain or be hot then these are some really great um, newsletters to sign up for and receive. And the other one, which I haven't seen the chat box, but everybody always asks about fire risk and planting. So my fire emergency hat goes on and says, keep things clear from the house, be well prepared. And if you want to understand some of the information that's been put together around risks of um, tree corridors acting as wicks in the landscape, then this is the only document that I'm aware of that captures some of that. And it's um, riparian land and bushfires and it, you can find it with on Google, but it'll be um, there for you to know the name to search. So that's me. Thank you, Kylie. So um, I've just got a couple of things in the chat. One's a comment from Sue to say thanks, Kylie, for a great presentation. She's noticed that people are still planting the tree loosen, and, and which can be a weedy problem in many situations. So thanks for raising that point about the potential woody species. Absolutely. It's um it's a really important one because there's some um great species, um, but it and and then they yeah create some other environmental issues. Um, and uh, Beck and Warren have just asked, how close is too close for eucalyptus to be near a dam? <clears throat> uh, apart from the fact that if you've got an existing one, well, it's probably okay. Um, I wouldn't be pl planting. Never plant on a dam bank if you can um, understand that because you'll undermine the integrity of the bank. And if you have eucalypts coming up in a dam bank, it's really important to remove them as they're growing. Otherwise, and it depends on every landscape, but to be um, probably, you wouldn't want any of the materials from the tree height falling in the dam, for example, and planting above it's safer than below it where the wall is or any, miss any overflow? <laughs> Is that helping at all? Thanks, Kylie. So um, do we have any other questions? That's it for the chat box. I'm just wondering if anybody else has any other questions. Um, so just quickly, Kylie, we've just talked about, um, just, I'm just wondering what your comments are. We've talked about fencing off trees whether they're individual paddock trees or clump of trees or so. Um, what's sort of, that's a balance between those trees providing a shelter, you know, overhead radiant heat versus having them fenced off and not as accessible. So how do you decide when to do what? Yeah, and it's really hard because the compaction under trees can be quite a concern. So, um, and in it depends, in a smaller property, it's a bit harder. So there's ways to fence so that you leave the shade side in the afternoon exposed for stock. So think of more of a triangular type mm. fencing from the so that the stock can gain shade in the afternoon, maybe not in the morning, and that you fence that morning side off um, so that they can be um, protected to some extent. 
Otherwise, to be fencing an area and then only using it and, and use it as a paddock, as a paddock of trees and, and have that more open gate policy in extreme conditions. So that a short period of time, for example, when it's a bit more dry, the tree's not going to suffer as much as, as a constant exposure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so does anybody else have any other questions before we finish up? Um, if not, so I'll just I'll wrap it up for tonight. Um, I'll send participants. I've all got I've got all your um, email addresses, so I'm going to send you some of the resources that Kylie's provided, as well as a link to this webinar if you wanted to have a look back over it. Um, and I'll also be sending you a short evaluation for the webinar, just with a few questions in it. One of the reasons we do this is as to provide us with feedback is, you know, how, how we might do this if a little bit differently, but it's also, it just supports um, when we're looking from, you know, um, putting up a case for more funding to continue these type of projects as well. So, um, so in that case, I'll just, uh, thanks to Kylie, for a really informative presentation, really interesting presentation. Um, thanks to everyone for attending. Um, I hope you gain some uh, useful knowledge and um, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks, everyone. Good night.